Whether quicker or not, actually the atmosphere should be a bit quicker. I think you're going to be all right in the race. Oh, you know, well, I'll tell you on full tanks, it's yeah, nice. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. No problems. I hope. As timed practice starts, favourites for pole position are the Honda-powered Williams. World champion Prost in the Porsche-powered McLaren. Both the Williams cars look for a clear run, followed by the Renault-powered Ligier. With a flying lap of 1 minute 25.8 seconds, Nelson Piquet's Honda Williams lays claim to pole position. But his main rival, Ayrton Senna, in the Renault-powered Lotus, goes ahead by less than half a second, almost immediately. It took Piquet just nine laps, and his first set of sticky qualifying tyres are finished. Each team is allowed two sets of qualifying tyres, and to prevent cheating, an official marks them with a code. Qualifiers are made from a special compound that goes sticky when it gets hot. If we can get them nice and warm, we can sort of go out and get into it on the first lap, or certainly at the end of the first lap. Yeah, and then if, if, if you get it into the first lap, would you be able to get a second one out of No, that's it. That's it, because it's a quite a long lap there, and they're gone. So you really, I mean, in terms of qualifying laps, you get two qualifying laps this afternoon, and that's it. Put it away. Which is a bit crazy. The car is ready for its debut. Formula One includes a set of dimensions to which every car must conform. But before it can be measured, the flat spots must be rolled out of the tyres. Tombe will not drive the new car in this race. His is still being finished back at the Heathrow factory. While other teams grapple for a position on the grid, Japanese technicians in the Williams pit quietly prepare extra engines in case the others explode. These Honda V6s are said to produce up to 1,200 horsepower for qualifying. But today, all eyes are on this new act as it enters the Formula One arena for the first time. The diminutive V6 can now run in anger, its onboard computer holding left and right hand banks of cylinders in fiery equilibrium. Jones, feeling grip in his tyres, tries for a quick lap. Qualifying tyres on the rear of the car tend to warm up quicker than the front, so the team have developed a system for preheating the front tyres before leaving the pits. But technologists from Goodyear are concerned about the effect this might have on the compound. I want to try and get back out if I can and have another go. The, the reason I went for it on the first lap is because the front tyres actually felt quite good. They were hanging in there. So it's pointless doing another lap, that's what I went for. <laughs> Is he happy with the pickup now? Is he happy with it? <laughs> Is he never happy with it? Probably never. I'll ask him this. Another set of tyres are being gently cooked. How are those tyres doing? There should be another couple could of minutes. Could do another four minutes. Yeah. 
As the qualifying hour ticks away, a problem is discovered. The left-hand rear brake caliper is rubbing on the wheel rim. blankets, the front tyres are readied for another quick lap. Despite pleas from Jones for an extra powerful qualifying engine, Cosworth have refused to build one, believing instead that a track record of reliability will pay off in the long run. Jones cannot better his first attempt, and as other teams improve their performance, slips to 21 on the grid. Cranifus gives Jones his latest lap time of 1 minute 30.8 seconds. Despite his lack of horsepower, Jones, determined to have another go, decides to cobble together a set of tyres from his used qualifiers in the hope of knocking a few tenths of a second off his lap time. Just trying to make a decent set of tyres out of the two that I've used. Yeah, just, I mean, two, two tenths and you're eights or nines. Yeah, no. it's, it's, it's very close there. At the other end of the pit lane, Nelson Piquet has used up his qualifiers and watches his Williams teammate Nigel Mansell try to push Lotus off pole position. <laughs> Jones decides to put race tyres on the rear of the car and qualifiers on the front. But Cosworth's Paul Ray spots a problem. The exhaust has cracked just ahead of the turbocharger. Today's game is over. The team was not working well. A weakness seized upon by the battalions in the pit lane and spotted early on by Benetton team manager Peter Collins. Actually getting personalities to work together and to gel and to, to actually work as a team rather than a number of individuals working for the same company is, is really a very, very difficult thing to do. Symptoms of this failure to gel were already evident as far back as pre-season testing, when the early electronic engine management system was first tried at full boost. The team trailer is a mobile workshop. 
Inside, Steve Taylor and Chief Development Engineer Martin Walters pass the latest strategy or map from the main computer to the electronically programmable memory, or EEPROM. Hello. About three minutes. This is known as burning a chip. Each chip can produce quite different behavior from the same engine. Well, obviously, the mapping data is different. It's, uh, this has got the most latest specification in the, uh, in the chip for the, uh, for the engine calibration. It is 10 past 10, and with rain forecast, there's no time to lose. The EEPROM carrier is clipped into the module. Before the team can allow the car out, they must check the engine kill switch on the steering wheel. This is a safety device to stop the engine if the throttle jams. It fails to work. Immediately, the team assume that it's a fault of the program in the engine management computer. Yeah, I know, precisely. I don't know the thing, which is still bad. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that, so we ought to sort it. Yeah. Paul has got, I think, the, the program that was run at Snitterton. Yes. We can't run the car like that because it hasn't got the field map in for the for the yes, But at least we can see if the kill switch works on that. Yes, okay. Because presumably it did work as net. It did work. Yeah, no, it worked. I mean, yeah, no one said it didn't. Well, it worked so at the shop because, I mean, we tried, we checked. Yeah. Did it work at the shop yesterday then? Harry, did that work yesterday at the shop? Or does anybody really know? It did or it didn't? That worked yesterday. Yeah. I think the first thing is what Paul's doing is to put that one in, which is the one that was run at Snetterton. Yeah. Okay. See if that works. If that doesn't work, then we have to have a look at the wiring. There's only three wires from, from that plug to there and back, so there's very little that can go wrong. They decide to change the module. But Steve Taylor is convinced that the program is correct and starts the painstaking search for a fault in the car's wiring. Because the engine is set for race boost, they cannot use the module from the slow run at Snetterton. The only engine management module available is this one from the previous dynamometer test. But because there's no need for a kill switch on the dynamometer, no one knows whether this module is correctly wired or not. No, it's oh, sorry, we just want to try it. We oh, just, yeah. We're not even going to try this. Hang on, this is one of these. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. And he says there's a whole patch of ice up against the pit wall on this side, but oh, yeah. just uh, very slowly. still doesn't work, and team manager Tyler Alexander turns his attention to the switch itself.